So I'm back in our project, and in this video, we're going to go about creating our first uh, material node or material filter that we're going to be able to run our inputs here or our mesh maps um, basically through. And it's going to allow us to texture uh, different areas of our mesh here. And we're going to have direct control over uh, kind of the materials that we're building up through this process. So to create a new graph, I'm going to come back up to our package here. I'm going to right click and hit new substance graph. And we're going to get this uh, pop up again. And I'm going to just select the PBR metallic roughness one. And I'm going to call this cord. And we're going to basically be making the material for this cord up uh, kind of back over there. So again, I'm going to leave all of the uh, default inputs just how they are and hit OK. And you can see what's going to happen in our 3D view here is uh, basically all the information of um, our other graph or megaphone graph is going to be gone because we've created a new graph and it's going to be viewing all of these uh, outputs and all of the inputs that we have placed into those. So the first thing I'm going to do is come down to here and I'm going to get rid of the height because again we're not using a height output so I don't need those guys anymore. And I'm also going to get rid of these guys here. And the reason I'm going to do that is because we don't want to drag and drop some of the resources that we've done in our megaphones here. We don't want to take our, our ambient occlusion and drag this guy in and start using this for our cord because for every material that we're making on this mesh here, we're going to want it to build on top of the last material or the last node that we have kind of in our chain. So instead of dragging and dropping these, uh, these base uh, mesh maps that are going to basically get us to make us start from uh, ground zero every time, we're going to allow ourselves to basically plug in our mesh maps from our parent graph here, our megaphone graph, and we're going to be able to just plug them through and continue kind of the chain along using only one instance of our bitmap. So that, again, might be a little bit confusing, but once we get going, it will make a little bit more sense. So instead of that bitmap, what I'm going to want to do is go to input. And so you can see that we have input color and input grayscale. And this is going to depend on what output node that you're plugging into. So to start, I'm going to do input grayscale. And you can see that because I'm going to be placing it in my ambient occlusion output, even though it accepts both a color and a grayscale, I know that the ambient occlusion maps are grayscale color format. So I'm going to want to have a grayscale node. And you can see actually, if I drag in my uh, ambient occlusion here, you can see that it is a grayscale color mode. And you can tell by the little gray dot there as well. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're not really familiar with uh, the color format of these different output types, that is an area that might mess you up as we go along. So make sure that you really understand what maps are, what kind of color format. So I'm going to plug this guy in and nothing's going to happen. And that is because while we have an input here, we don't actually have anything being plugged in to this input node. So if I come back to my megaphone here, and I click on this graph, and I drag it in, you can see that we've created an instance of this graph, and we're going to be able to plug our nodes into it, run it through the process within this node, and then output all of the different outputs back into our graph here. So you can see right now, all I have is our ambient occlusion. But if I plug the ambient occlusion, again, remember the ambient occlusion from our chord graph here into our output here, you can see it's going to go black. And that's because even though we've accepted 
and input in our graph here, our input is blank or black in that case. And remember that if we have an entirely black ambient occlusion, nothing is going to show up because it's assuming that everything is in complete darkness. So if we come back to our megaphone here, and you can see now that I have an input little bobble here. And I know just from what we just done, that is our ambient occlusion, but when we go back and fix it up a little bit, you're, we're going to be able to get those little uh, descriptor titles as well. But I'm going to take our ambient occlusion, and I'm going to plug that in. And you can see now that we're getting everything showing back up, because essentially what we've done is taken our parent graph with our base uh, mesh map or ambient occlusion map, taken it through our chord graph, so when we set up the material in there, it will be able to run through and we'll be able to use these maps and build on top of them. And then whatever we've built in that chord graph, we're going to be able to bring that back out and visualize that output onto our final material. So hopefully that makes a little bit more sense about how we're going to do this. And so we're going to go back into our chord graph and we're going to build up uh, input nodes so that we're going to be able to accept all of these uh, parent parameters, bring them through our chord graph here, our chord material, and then do whatever we want to do with them and then output them next to, the, to our next material, our next node, and then be able to view those outputs on our mesh. So that's what we're going to be doing. And I'll come back into our chord graph here. And I'm going to come down to our ambient occlusion here. And I just want to change a few different things about this. So you can see that on our ambient occlusion output, if we click on that, our identifier is ambient occlusion. So you can see that's our little identifier up there. And our label, which is more the human readable label, as you can see when we zoom out, we're going to get those little titles down there. That is what we're going to be able to read. And we've also got this in the material group. So we're going to take a look at groups a little bit later. But the gist of it is that it just allows you for easy hookups. So we're going to see what that means in a minute. But the first thing I want to take a look at is our identifier and our label. This is going to help us just understand what the node is uh, and what it's doing as well as determining again the usage of this node. So when I come over to our input, I'm going to click on that. I'm going to type, doesn't really need to be uh, super specific, uh, just something that is able to identify this node uh, within Substance Designer. I'm also going to create a label, so I'm going to call this AO. Actually, we'll call this ambient occlusion. We'll just keep it consistent with our input and output. Let's call that ambient occlusion. And I'm going to make sure that I put this in the material group. And again, just kind of do that for now, but we'll take a look at what that means in a second. The last thing I want to do is make sure that our usage is set to ambient occlusion. So be careful, there is an ambient usage and an ambient occlusion. We're going to want the ambient occlusion. And so now we've pretty much set up this node to accurately read and represent our ambient occlusion mesh map. So I'm going to do the same thing now. We're coming up for our metallic. I'm going to type input and again I know our metallic map is going to represent a grayscale image so I want input grayscale and I'm going to plug this guy in and I'm going to quickly just fill out all of these fields here so metallic I'll set the label to metallic and uh, making sure it's in the material group remember to also capitalize the M on material that is actually pretty important. It's very case sensitive. And I'm going to switch the usage to metallic. Where is it? I think it's down near the bottom. There we go. Metallic. 
Same thing for our roughness. Again, our roughness is a grayscale image. Plugging this guy in. Call this one roughness, roughness, and material. And I want to change the usage to roughness. And where are we? There we are. All right. And so now we've come to our normal and our base color. And these are output maps that I want to be represented in RGB. So I want them to be color format. So this time I'm going to type input and I'm going to use input color. And so I'm going to drag this guy in. Come up to our identifier. Just call it normal. Normal. And material. And I'm going to make its usage be normal. And there we go. And last but not least, we're going to do our base color. And again, it's an input color. Call this base color. And I like to leave spaces. At the end of the day, these ones are not super important. They're not case sensitive. It's only the group uh, parameter there, or the field. Uh, oh, base color. Base color. It's only the input field down at the bottom here that is case sensitive. And we'll make sure that this is base color as well. All right. So now that we've got our node uh, graph set up here, I'm going to come back into Megaphone. And you can see now that we've got all of these uh, inputs here. But you can see that they don't really uh, line up with our outputs here. And that's kind of, that's really just because of the order that we had uh, created our input nodes. So I'm going to come back into our chord graph. And just clicking in our graph area without actually clicking on any of the nodes, but just somewhere in the graph, I'm going to come down to our inputs here. And you can see what we've created, right? We've created uh, everything is in the material group. Our ambient occlusion, grayscale, metallic grayscale, roughness grayscale, and so on and so forth. And this is actually the order of our input sockets on our node back in our megaphone. So I know that um, our base color is up at the top. So I'm going to just click on this little, you can see once you bring your mouse cursor over these little uh, lines here, you can actually click and drag. So I'm going to reorder this up at the top. And our normal is going to be second. Our roughness is third. Metallic is fourth. And ambient occlusion is last. So now if I come to our megaphone graph, you can see it's effectively uh, rearranged all of our inputs to match our output sockets. So now what I want to do is I want to start plugging in our mesh maps and our starting values into our chord uh, material graph here. So I'm going to take our uniform color and plug that into our metallic. I want to take our uniform color and plug this into our roughness. I can take our normal, plug that into our normal. And I'm going to take our uniform color and plug that into there. So I'm just going to get rid of all of these connections right now. And you can see I'm going to get rid of that actually as well. So we've effectively input or imported all of our previous values, uh, sorry, our parent values from our parent graph here into our chord graph. And you can see that we've got those all plugged into the appropriate outlets. And so this is where using uh, material groups, right, when we were classifying each input node as a material group comes in handy. You can see that Right here, we've got these black bars that surround our uh, sockets on both sides. And if I come back into our chord here, and I come into our base color uh, output here, 
you can see that we're in the material group. But if I take this and I get rid of that, and I come back into our megaphone, you can see that now the base color actually isn't surrounded in that uh, black because it's no longer part of the material. And we're classifying your inputs and outputs uh, in specific groups comes in handy is it's going to allow you to do quick hookups. And what do I mean by quick hookups? Well, you can see up here in our uh, little toolbar, we have our link creation mode. And so if I click on that, right now we are operating in standard, right? We have one selection. I can only select one at a time. And if I'm to plug one of these guys in, it's just going to go from one socket to one socket. We also have our material. So if I click on this and I go to an area that uh, is within a group, you can see that if I click on one, it starts to drag out all of them. And if I go over to our outputs here, it's going to actually automatically hook them up to the appropriate output. And this is because our outputs were automatically set up to recognize the outputs based on their usage and the material group that they're in. But you can see that as I'm doing this, we're not going to get the functionality with our base color. And so that's why we need to make sure that when we're classifying our outputs and our inputs, we want to make sure that they're all within the same uh, group, just so that it's going to make our hookups a lot easier. So I'm going to go back and put that in our material and come back and we should have everything perfectly covered in our kind of black outline. And lastly, the compact material, it basically does the same thing as material, but it's just a visual difference. You can see that we've got a material node. And as I drag that over, it's going to plug in all of our outputs into the appropriate output. So nothing is different. It's just purely a visual difference. So now that we've gone ahead and pretty much figured out, you know, got a little, a little comfortable with our inputs and our outputs, I want to go and bring in one last resource that we're going to be using to plug into our node groups or our node graphs, I should say. And I'm going to come up to our resources and I'm going to find our megaphone ID map and I'm going to bring this in. And what this is is just a bunch of different colors. But if I plug this into our base color, you can see that it's pretty much just a whole bunch of different colors over top of our mesh here. And the reason that we use ID maps is kind of in the name. It is an identification of these different areas of our mesh here. And what we're going to do is be able to use these colors to allow us to mask off different areas of our mesh or our texture set here so that we can create different materials only in the regions that we want to create our materials in. So I'm going to plug back in our base color here and I'm going to bring this ID map down over here. I want to be able to now accept that ID map into our node group here and then be able to select the area that I want to mask off for this specific node. And the reason that I'm doing this outside in our parent graph as opposed to within the chord graph itself is because by the time that we are done with our material, we're going to have several of these big, massive, and possibly bloated uh, node setups and these node groups to make our materials with. Um, so to try and avoid instancing this bitmap within every single node setup that we have is going to be a little bit costly um, and something that we can ultimately avoid just by allowing a reference of it from our parent graph. So I'm going to come back into our chord graph here. I'm going to drag all of these back. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to type in input. And again, our ID map obviously is an RGB. It's a color value map. So I'm going to do color. 
And in our parameters here, I'm going to call this ID map and just call this ID map. And so now this ID map is a little bit different because we're only going to be importing to it, but we're never actually going to be uh, outputting from it. So we don't need to clarify or specify the, uh, the group. I'm also going to come down to our integration attributes, and I'm going to call this uh, basically an any usage. And I'm going to specify specifically just RGB because we don't want to use the alpha channel um, of this image. All right. So now if I come back into our megaphone, you can see that we've got this little extra tidbit down there, and this is called ID map. So now we're going to be able to plug this guy into our cord material here, and you can see that. We're getting it show up. And if we come into our cord, we're going to have our ID map come in through here. And this is where we're going to be able to branch off and go, okay, this is the area from our ID map that I want to isolate for this specific node setup. So now that we've got our uh, ability to accept our ID map set up, I want the ability to start, you know, using that to be able to mask off this part of our material. And so one really good uh, node that's actually default to Substance Designer is called the Color to Mask node. So I'm going to select our ID map, and I'm going to hit Color to and Mask. And you can see that uh, if we get a little bit of a drop down, we're able to extract a, a grayscale map or a mask from a color selection. So I'm going to bring that guy in. And the parameters down here, uh, we get a little bit of pretty cool options. So for our keying type, we have RGB. We can also do chrominance and luminance values as well. Uh, but because we have an RGB map, I want to use our RGB. And now you can see that if I click this guy, we have a whole range of different color values that we're able to use to mask off our selection. So that's, you know, that's pretty cool, but you're kind of like, okay, how do I see the color value that I want to actually mask off in my view here because you know I can't remember every single color value that's in that map. And so it would be kind of nice if there was a way that because we have this chord uh, graph within our megaphone graph here, it would be nice if we could see the actual inputs in our chord graph as we're editing. And currently in Substance Designer, there is that option. Now it is an experimental, at least for the version that I have, but it will allow us to edit our sub material nodes within our parent graph uh, using the inputs that we plug in, which is really handy. So to enable that, I have to come up to my edit and preferences, and I have to come down to graph. And you can see that enable graph editing in context. And again, for me, it's experimental. For you, it might not be experimental. It doesn't really affect performance too much. And I'm just going to select that guy, go down to apply, and hit OK. So now I'm not going to be able to actually see any of these inputs by going up and clicking on my graph. What I have to do is go into my megaphone where I've got my graph uh, referenced. And I have to come down here and right click. And you can see now we're going to get open reference in context. And the shortcut for that is control E. So now when I click that, you can see that we're getting all of the inputs from our parent graph here that we've plugged in. And we're getting them show up in our input nodes here. And so this is what's going to allow us to uh, be able to, in context, reference uh, and edit these subgraphs. So I'm going to just take our color here because I can't quite remember which color our chord is. And I'm going to plug that into our base color just so we can see. 
And so it looks like the red color in our graph here is going to be the uh, UVs for our cord. And so with that, I'm going to just single click on our mask. I'm going to click on the little eyedropper tool and I'm going to select the red. And you can see now when I double click on this, what we've done is just masked off the areas that our cord, uh, the UVs of our cord actually show up. So now I'm going to bring this guy back over here. And so that's awesome. Now we have the mask that we're going to be able to use to work with this material. But how do I go about actually implementing that? Well, the first thing I want to do is you can see that occasionally when we edit things in context, our thumbnails kind of go blank. So I'm going to right click in my graph and just compute node thumbnails so I can see what we're working with. And so we're going to want to start using blend nodes to blend in some different values that are only going to affect our cord mesh uh, areas. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my base color here and just drag these guys down. And I'm going to just select a blend. And I'm also going to now take a uniform color node and plug this guy in and we'll make it just black. So right now we're affecting the whole material because we haven't actually isolated any regions that we want to work with. So using this color mask here, and I'm just going to compute our thumbnails again, I'm going to use this guy and plug him into the opacity of our blend. And you can see pretty much immediately and relatively easily, um, we've started to mask off the uh, area of our mesh here. And this is going to allow us to really hone in on those specific areas and create the materials without affecting uh, the other areas that we don't wish to affect using this material. So that's really cool. This is a really handy uh, and neat way to work with texturing your assets. So I'm going to come up here with our normal map and I'm going to bring this guy up too just so that we can kind of see what's going on. And so I'm going to want to affect the normal map a little bit on this guy, but I want to be able to combine both our baked normal map as well as contributing a little bit more uh, normal from our material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a normal node and I'm actually going to move these guys just kind of over here so we're not really in the way of other nodes and let's say that with this guy here I want to force his alpha to one so he's got that you know kind of mid blue color and I'm going to use a fractal sum base and so we're going to use this just to give it a little bit of noise. You can see right there, just a little bit of noise on our cord. And I'm going to use a normal combine. And so when I do that, you can see that this is normal one, which we're going to want to have our base mesh map material, right? The, the normals that we baked from the high poly. And I'm going to want to plug this guy in over top. And so that's going to give us a little bit of uh, unique normals again, but still based off the pre existing normals that we have. But now the problem is that we're getting those normals showing up everywhere. And if you're a little bit familiar with Substance Designer, you might go, Oh, well, there actually is a node that lets you use a mask because you can see that with the normal combine, we're not going to have the ability to use the mask. And uh, that is a pretty you know, kind of, that's a pretty astute observation, but unfortunately, the problem with the normal blend node, and if we take a look here, go normal blend, it allows for the input of a mask. However, the process behind the node um, doesn't actually allow you to use a bit of an overlay between the normals. 
And let's just take a look at that. So you can see right now, there actually is no overlay. And if I bring the opacity down, But if I come in and use our mask here, you can see that it's pretty much an all or nothing. So this right here, it's maybe a little hard to tell on your uh, screen, you know, on YouTube and everything, but if we take a look in here. You can see that it is using entirely the normals from our fractal sum base here, based on the mask that we have created. And so what you could do is come in here and, you know, lower the opacity a little bit to get kind of the, you know, the correct values and a bit of the blend of the normals. But that's, that's more of a guessing game than you really want to do. And then if you want to have a little bit more uh, harsher normals or stronger normals, then you're going to have to come in and start playing with the blend value and the blend amounts and all of that. And it's, it's just too much guessing work for what we want to do. As you can see with the normal combined here, it actually combines both our base mesh map normals as well as our normals here into a perfect blend. And we actually have uh, basically a different quality slider. Now for such minute detail, you're not going to notice much of a difference. So for performance, I'm just going to leave it on whiteout. But that's kind of the reason we didn't use the normal blend. It's just too much guessing work for what we want to do. And so instead, there is a different method with which we're going to be able to mask off these normals. So in that long roundabout way, um, this is how we're going to go about masking off the normals from the other areas of our material that we don't want our normals to show up. So what I'm going to do is add a blend after our normal combine. And I'm gonna go get our mask, and I'm gonna plug this guy in. So you can see right now it really hasn't done anything, and that's because we don't have anything in our foreground. But remember what our masks are doing, right? Anywhere that is white, when plugging a mask into a blend node, Anything that is white is going to show what is in the top node. And anywhere that is black is going to show what is in the bottom node. Well, what do we want? What do we want to show up in the white areas, right? Well, we want our normals for our cord. So what I'm going to do, and I'm just shift and then left clicking here, is I'm going to plug this guy into the top because that is the normals that I want to show up for the areas where our cord is. And you can see that once I've done that, it's gotten rid of the normals on the rest of our mesh and it's kept them on our cord here. But now the problem is there isn't any normals showing up, uh, any baked normals for our low poly here. And you can see that we come back over here, right? If we do this, if we, uh, if we do this guy over here, you can see that we're getting all that normal information. But as soon as we plug this guy in over top, we're not actually getting any normal information. So it's just black. So what I want to do is now take our baked normals and I'm going to plug that into the bottom. So that now when I plug that in, you can see that in our blend here, we're getting the, a lot of moving around our mesh here, we're going to get those mixed or combined normals on our cord, but then the areas where our mask isn't covering, I just want to have our regular baked mesh normals so that we get a nice perfect blend between the two, and we're not going to awkwardly affect one or the other. and. In terms of that normal blend node that I was talking about, there isn't any guesswork. We know exactly what we're doing with these nodes so that we're alleviating any frustration that we might have with working with a blend node because we know exactly what we're doing and have just that much more control over the processes and the pipeline of our workflow here. 
So now I'm going to continue along working on our metallic roughness and our ambient occlusion. And for these ones, it's not really going to be too much, too much that we're really doing with it because again, this, well, the roughness is going to be pretty uniform. Um, the metallic, obviously, this is not a metallic object. And the ambient occlusion, we might be able to blend in a little bit of ambient occlusion information, but because there really isn't too much in terms of micro ambient occlusion, it really is non-essential anyways, but we'll take a look at it. So the next one I'm going to do is our roughness here. And I like to get a little bit of our roughness information from our uh, normal map here. And I like to do that in the form of our curvature smooth. And you can see that it, when I plug in our normal here, we're going to be able to get some uh, noise information. Now, again, a little bit of context for how roughness maps work. Um, the whiter areas or the brighter areas are rougher, whereas the darker areas are a little bit glossier. So I'm going to go ahead and blend these two together. And when I plug this guy in, you can see that, uh, unfortunately, what it's done is it's now plugged in the roughness for our entire object again. And so what we'll have to do is find our mask up here and then just drag that guy down so that all of the roughness uh, in here has been left untouched. And the only roughness that we're going to be able to affect is the roughness of our cord here. And so we can play around with our curvature smooth by adding in a levels node. So we can make it a little bit more uh, rough. Or we can make it a little bit glossier too. And so I kind of like where it's at a little bit there. Maybe going to make it a little bit shinier, but make the spots that are rougher, a little bit more uh, contrasted, just something like that. Again, just to get a little bit of variation in the roughness. We can play around with this a little bit more. Yeah, to something that looks like that. So I'm happy with that for our roughness. I'm gonna just consolidate these a little bit better. For our metallic, well, because I, like I said before, we're not actually, uh, we don't have any metal on this part of our material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just leave this for now just as black because what it's doing is it's coming through, declaring that this material is black or non-metal, and then it's just passing through. And because we already have the black value set up um, in our parent graph, we don't really need to affect that at all. So I'm just going to leave that as is. And lastly, our ambient occlusion. So the ambient occlusion, again, for something as minute as this, it may not necessarily be overly worth it, but I'm going to go ahead and play with it just a little bit, just because I can. And so I'm going to add a blend. And again, remember, because we've got black in our ambient occlusion, everything is going to go black as it's in complete darkness. And I'm going to find where we've got a little bit of that normal information from our uh, fractal here. And I'm going to use this to plug into my ambient occlusion. So you can see that's going to give this weird kind of shadow. It almost looks like dirt, but it's actually shadow information. Uh, across our material here. And not going to really need most of that, obviously, on our material. So once again, I'm going to just use our mask to mask that off. And I want to come in here and I want to be able to just keep all of the darker values, but I want to remove the lighter values because where we want our ambient occlusion to show up is actually in the more recessed areas or the darker areas of our material. So the blending mode that we can use for that is called multiply. And so you can see that we're going to be able to keep 
uh, basically the a ambient occlusion map that we've actually baked out from our mesh and just add a little bit of variety onto it. And now I'm going to also bring the opacity down to something like 0.15, just so that we're getting a little bit of information. Again, that's why I kind of said this part is a little bit negligible, but we're going to be able to use this in our other nodes and our other graph setups. So it's something that we can kind of get familiar with a little bit. And so now the last thing I want to do for this graph here is I want to add some color variation. Again, just using the, uh, the noise or the normal input that we have from our fractal sum here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add another blend node onto our base color here. And I'm going to come back to our uniform color. And right now, I don't want this to be a, a solid black, but rather a bit of a kind of like an off black, more like a gray. Just to be something a little bit like that. So it's not pure black. And I also want to change the resolution of this node just for performance sake, because right now you can see that we're actually loading a 2K image that is one color. And if we take a look here, you can't even really see it because it's so uh, close to um, the output there. But if I bring this back down, we can take a look. So you can see that we're basically allocating memory to load a 2K texture that is one color. And so we don't really need this node for the size, but rather we just need it for the color. So I'm going to Control Z that so we get our color again. And I'm clicking on this node and coming up to our output size. And I want to set this to an absolute size because right now it is relative to parent. So whatever we make this, uh, if I just click on this here, whatever we make the parent size of this graph to be, it's going to be relative to that. But I want to indefinitely make this 16 by 16 pixels. So something really, really small. So you can see now that this is a 16 by 16, and this is a 2048 by 2048. But this is our base color, so it's kind of setting the size for our parent graph. So we're going to leave this one alone. But we don't really need to waste the resource power on a 2K texture when all we're getting from it is color value. So now that we've uh, pretty much situated this guy here, I'm going to just Control and D to duplicate it because now I want to use another color value for some color variation. So I'm going to plug this guy in. I'm going to change the color to be something just a little bit brighter. And I'm also going to take our mask here and plug that in so that it's only affecting our chord. And so now I'm going to want to actually affect our mask here a little bit so that it's going to allow us to have some color variation on top of our normal mask, but within the confines of the mask so that we're getting some information only on this core. So again, that might be a little bit confusing, but let's just take a look and see what we can do. So I know that I can get a lot of edge information from our normal map here. And again, I've done this with our curvature node. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our levels here, and I'm just going to drag out, and I'm going to add a blend. So I'm going to take our mask and plug this in over top. And so right now, we're going to pretty much just get our mask. But if we use a different type of blending mode, such as multiply, you can see that we're going to get a bit of variation in our mask, but it's only confined within the limits of our chord material here. And so again, remember that with the multiply blending mode, it's going to keep everything on in our foreground, in our top layer here. It's going to keep all of the black or darker values and get rid of the white. Well, if we get rid of the white values, we're going to be able to see what's underneath, which is going to be 
our curvature here. So the final result is we've kept all the black values and we've altered anything within the white. So now when I plug this in, you can see that we're going to get just a little bit of color variation. And if I really crank this up just by using a levels node, you can see that I'm going to really, really mask off different areas. Just like that. So if I just bring these guys over here just to make it a little bit easier to see with our uh, node setup. So now I can even change the blending mode here, right? I can bring down the opacity of our blend, can change the blending mode to give us a bunch of different results. And I'm going to choose something like overlay. Maybe make this a little bit brighter there, just to get some edge information. And it's just going to allow us to add some color variation to our chord here. And so now the last thing that I want to do is I want to expose some parameters. So I'm going to come down into our color input or our color mask here. Because I don't want to have to come into this graph every single time when I want to edit things. And I instead can just expose parameters so that when we're in our megaphones graph, I can just click on the node. All of the parameters will pop up and I can just play around with them. So the first one I want to do is I want to expose this color parameter. And the nice thing about this is that if I expose this parameter, it's actually going to allow us to select different regions within our uh, ID map. So this is actually going to allow us to make this node setup reusable for other areas and not just specific to this cord mesh, uh, sorry, cord UV region of our mesh. And so that's really useful. That's very robust. So the way that we can expose parameters, again, making sure to click on the node, I'm going to come up to this little graph here and I'm going to do expose. And so the input name is color. I'm just going to leave it on color and we're going to hit OK. So now you can see that when I click on this node, I can't actually access that anymore. But if I double click on the graph area, you can see that in our input parameters, if I drop that down, we get a color float three. And this is all of the information that we have just exported or exposed. So I'm going to leave the identifier as color, but I'm going to call this ID color. And so that's what we're going to be able to see when we edit this outside in our parent graph. And the default color right now is going to be the color red because that is what we exposed um, when working with this node in this specific graph. So by default, it's going to uh, basically mask off our red area, but we can go ahead and change the default if we wanted to. I'm not going to do that. And I'm just going to put this under the group ID. So that's the first parameter that I want to mask off. The second parameter that I want to mask off has to deal with our fractal sum base. And so I want to mask off the min and the max levels because that's going to give us the ability to play around with some different uh, variations of the noise and the information that we're getting from this height information. So I'm going to come over here and expose this. Min level is fine. And I'm also going to expose our max level. And again, we're going to want to change this to max level so that there's not an overlap in the input names. So now when I double click on our graph and come down here, you can see that we have our ID. But now we've got our min level and our max level. And so I'm going to leave the defaults as is, but I'm going to put this under the group normal. And you can see that we get that little normal identifier up there. And I'm going to do the same thing for our max level. And what we're doing is grouping these together so that in our parent graph, we're actually going to have all of these under one drop down area. 
so that they're kind of grouped together so you can get the sense that, oh, these are going to be kind of affecting the same thing. I'm also going to export our normal intensity just in case we want to you know, bump up the intensity a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit too low for us right now. And we can go intensity is fine. And if I scroll all the way down here and find intensity, I'm going to call this normal intensity. And I'm also going to put this in the normal group. So now that I've got all of those exposed, if I come into our megaphone here, you can see now that when I click on chord, we have these two drop downs. And you can see that the ID color here. So if I was to select, say, let's do, mm, let's do the blue. You can see now that I've actually just remapped uh, the chord material to fit a different region of our mesh here. And if I click on this guy and do this, you can see now it's going to map to that. And this is going to make our materials heavily reusable in case we further down the line go, oh, you know what? I have this great material. I'm just going to copy it and remask it to a different part. If we come back over to our chords over here, you can also see that if I close the ID group and come into the normal group, again, this is where grouping our uh, outputs or parameters is useful. I can also change the normal intensity. Let's do 10. And you can see that's going to look really disgusting, but it's given us the ability to play around with these inputs. We can also change the min level, the max level. And this just further increases the flexibility that we have with these reusable materials. And it's going to allow us to speed up the process as we continuously build these materials. So in this tutorial, we've learned a lot. We've created a new subgraph that we're going to be able to develop and build our material in. We understand what inputs and outputs do and how we can actually create these graphs to develop filters that we can run our materials through. We've figured out how to set up ID maps, use them to mask off uh, various areas, and reuse these materials to actually fit numerous needs across our mesh, and even how to set up contextual editing for our graphs so that we can develop them in real time. In the next tutorial, we're going to take a look at creating a node template or a graph template so that we don't have to create all of these new uh, subgraphs by scratch every time, and instead we develop a very easy template that's going to allow us to pretty much be rapidly prototyping these materials on the fly 